So we'll just kind of wing this. Uh, if Springer isn't coming, we'll just adjust the order of things. It'll be fine. And I, your main question for him, I could speak to it indirectly if he doesn't end up making it too. Okay, that sounds standard good. Standard question answer that we get a lot. Mm -hmm. All right, it's two o'clock. We'll go ahead and get this um, virtual panel started. Uh, my name is Danny Bierschwal with the Big Sky Resort Area District. Thank you so much for joining us for a vibrant discussion today with experts in the field of emergency management. Um, today is our second virtual panel. We just wrapped up a water supply discussion, um, which is going to be available online. And we're in day two of community week activity here in Big Sky. Um, all of the information and um, recordings are available on bigskycommunityweek.com. So if you're unable to join the conversation today, we certainly have the opportunity to stay connected and keep you informed after the fact. Um, with that, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our moderator today for this discussion. Um, many of you know him. He's a neighbor and a, a good friend of Big Sky, Mr. Joe O'Connor, who is now the, congratulations on the, the new role, the managing editor of uh, Mountain Journal. So um, with that, I want to turn it over to Mr. Joe to guide us through this discussion today. Appreciate that, Danny. Hi everyone, and uh, and welcome to this panel discussion on emergency management, uh, a part of Community Week put together by Big Sky Resort Area District and Big Sky Chamber of Commerce. Uh, as Danny mentioned, I'm Joe O'Connor, uh, managing editor for Mountain Journal. Uh, we're a nonprofit public interest conservation journalism site uh, dedicated to saving the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Um, you know, our, for your information, our stories are free online at uh, mountainjournal.org. Emergency management is a critical topic and one that holds particular importance for me. Uh, as a former ski patroller and, and wildland firefighter, uh, I've been on the ground during emergency scenarios. And as a resident of Big Sky, uh, I am as curious as the rest of you um, and interested about our emergency management plan and pr protocols. In the West, uh, we know how serious natural disasters can be wildfire, earthquakes, um, devastating flooding like we saw last spring in Southwest Montana and Yellowstone National Park. In Big Sky, uh, we have a unique uh, scenario. We have a one way in, one way out situation with Highway 64, you know, dead ending at uh, Moonlight Basin. Um, many of you have asked the questions, you know, what do we do in an emergency requiring an evacuation? How will we know? What preparations can we make? Uh, so here with me today to answer these questions are the people who make those calls. Um, Patrick Lonergan uh, serves as Chief of Emergency Management and Fire for Gallatin County. Uh, Greg Meegard is Chief of the Big Sky Fire Department. Joe Brummel is with us, uh, Director of Disaster and Emergency Services for Madison County. Uh, and Caleb Schreiber is Zone Fire Management Officer for the Custer Gallatin National Forest. Uh, we are hoping that uh, Sheriff Dan Springer with Gallatin County can join us. He's here. Excellent. Sheriff Springer, welcome. Uh, and welcome to all of you. Uh, we only have an hour, so I'd like to remind our panelists to please keep your responses to five minutes or less. Uh, we'll have a short uh, amount of time at the end of our discussion for audience questions. Uh, you can submit these questions on Facebook or Zoom, and we'll hold them until the end of our conversation. Uh, and as Danny mentioned, a recording of this discussion will be available tomorrow morning at BigSkyCommunityWeek.com. Uh, with that, let's get started. Um, Joe and Patrick, I'd like to start with you. Uh, you know, Patrick, maybe we'll start with you first. So a quick hit here. You guys, you know, have been in the thick of uh, a lot of, you know, emergency scenarios planning. Um, were there any lessons that, that you learned from the historic flooding in Southwest Montana this spring? Sure, you, there's a couple of takeaways and, and it's nothing new. And you know, they're the same messages that you typically hear officials give time and time again. You know, the number one is everybody should be self-sufficient with what you need um, to stand alone for a given period of time. And, you know, we, we saw that in our neighbors next door to Clark County and they got kind of lucky 
you know, there for a while, it looked like Gardner was going to be in a world of hurt and cut off for an extended period of time. And that would have been very logistically challenging to support that community by air um, with the amount of people that were in it. So, you know, whether you're stuck because of a flood or whatever the situation, we really encourage people to be self-sufficient with whatever those needs that they are for themselves, that they need for themselves and their, and their family and their pets and, and whatever that may be. And, and plan on taking care of yourself for, you know, at least 72 hours because it takes time to get help. And there will always be those that need immediate help. And the more self-sufficient you are, the better it is for your overall community and allows the emergency officials to focus on those that truly need that immediate support if you can hold out for a little while. You know, and another takeaway is that as much as we like to pride ourselves on, we'll take care of our communities, we're resilient, we'll respond to the emergency of our stuff locally. At a certain point, any community is overcome with their capacity to respond locally. And it relies upon your neighbors supporting you from neighboring jurisdictions, the state and the federal agencies coming in. And largely speaking, a huge piece that sometimes is overlooked when we talk about recovery and communities getting back to normal, that's our nonprofit partners. I mean, they are a linchpin to private individuals getting support quickly and getting help to try and get their life back normal as quickly as possible. So while those may not be unique or new to our flooding, they were definitely reinforced. And I guess those are the, the takeaways that I would throw out. And I'll pass it over to Joe to add to that. Yeah, sure, Joe. Any any thoughts there specifically? You know, just quickly, Patrick, you know, you're mentioning, you know, being self-sufficient as best you can, being prepared and, and having, you know, supplies and, and everything for, you know, up to 72 hours is sort of like airlines, you know, saying when, you know, when the oxygen mask come down, put it on yourself first, because you're not going to be of help to anyone without it. But anyway, without without further ado, Joe Rummel. Thank you. Yeah, I like to echo a lot of sentiments Patrick said, but, um, you know, it's being self-sufficient, you know, we can rely on each other's and it's a good thing about Southwest Montana neighbors are always there to step up and help out when and where they can. But mm -hmm. even that we see on the local stage and what's at the national stage right now, regardless if it's a flood or whatever event, even if FEMA does come in, they don't have a magic wand to wave. They're not going to make everything better right away. It's kind of a long-term event. And we always like to really plan for the worst, but always try and hope for the best. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. That's a good point. Um, you know, Patrick, a follow-up for you quickly. You know, you, you're, you know, the head of the Gallatin County Emergency Management. Uh, you've been working on emergency planning for years. Who makes the evacuation plan and who ultimately decides what happens in the face of an emergency? You bet. So, you know, ideally, and we strive really hard to make all of our emergency plan development very collaborative with all the agencies they have jurisdiction. And that agencies having jurisdiction is a very, very key term when we talk about emergency planning and authorities, but basically it means it's a legal entity that has some sort of charge in state law that says you're responsible for this function. Um, and then there's a whole assortment of supporting organizations that help those lead agencies that have the authority to carry out that tasking. And so we work very hard amongst those agencies having jurisdiction, the supporting agencies, our elected officials, to ensure that we have common processes in place mm -hmm. and that roles and responsibilities are clearly delineated in the plans um, so that we have consistency across all our organizations as best as possible. So mm -hmm. the process is the same. So it doesn't matter whether you have a Bozeman police officer coming down to Big Sky or you have, you know, a trooper or a sheriff's deputy to help with an incident, hopefully they're operating largely in the same fashion, using the same terminology. They have the same expectations of authorities and who's in charge and that, that structure and, and how we do evacuations in Gallatin County. So it's consistent, not only for the responders carrying out their mission, but also for um, the residents that are being given instructions and are interacting with them. In Montana, the core of the Montana code annotated Real, when you talk about disasters, really lies with the governing bodies of the political subdivisions. So that's the municipalities, and then in the unincorporated areas, the county commissioners. Um, and so ultimately, those typically are the people that sign and formally promulgate and adopt those emergency plans. 
Sometimes some of these specific plans are very specific authorities and other people will sign on to them. But at a certain point, it just becomes impractical to have everybody that has a piece of the pie sign every single document. So typically you'll see those mayors and those county commissioners be the ones that are the, the final signatory authority on, on these planning documents um, dealing with large scale emergencies. Um, when it comes to decisions during a large incident, um, again, those decisions come down to the authorities spelled out in those emergency plans. And in some cases, it's very clear. There's very specific statutory authorities um, that a given individual, such as the sheriff, may have. In other cases, those authorities um, are spelled out in the plan and delegated to a certain individual. So there's some functions in large disasters that are not statutorily defined, but they're functions that the counties and the cities need to carry out and support. And those get delegated to a given individual or entity um, through the adoption of that planning document. Uh, look at my notes here real quick here. A key player at the strategic level when we talk about large scale disasters are what state law calls principal executive officer. And that's the mayor or the chairman of the board of county commissioners. And that principal executive officer is the one that in statute is charged with supplemental powers during a disaster or a declared emergency to carry out things um, such as curfews, evacuations, suspending you know, policies, stuff like that. Um, and so typically that's kind of the, a lot of these things come back to the principal executive officer. However, the caveat of Montana code annotated is that it's not always that clean. And it says those powers must be implemented through a, pro through a proclamation or a resolution. And then if you read what it takes to do that, it takes the bot unanimous vote, not unanimous vote, it takes a majority vote of the, uh, governing body. So we talk about the principal executive officer being, you know, the front person and the one with this authority, but for them to enact that, it takes that governing body's action um, to really, truly implement some of those large scale disaster powers. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the uh, real gist of kind of emergency planning. We try really hard to be collaborative across all the agencies. Um, we work, you know, very closely with um, those that specifically have authorities in state law and those that support it when when we encourage anybody that has interest that's a partner agency in some response fashion when we're working on that portion of the plan to participate and provide feedback and and for some agencies it's very specific um, and it, it's not a big lift and for some agencies that's a pretty big lift and we appreciate their participation you know you talk about the sheriff's office they have a little piece of a lot of different things so um, they're a major planning partner with us. And then there's other agencies that, you know, have one little piece that they're responsible for and they do that very well, but um, we appreciate everybody's participation as we're trying to develop this, maintain it and keep everybody up to speed on, on what the game plan is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Well, you know, governing agencies having to sign off on things, you know, on a plan or on a specific scenario. I mean, I imagine, in an emergency, these things need to happen pretty quickly. Uh, and it does sound like there's a lot of collaboration going on. That's that's key. I'll jump over to you, uh, Sheriff Springer. Um, you know, what what is the Sheriff's Department's sort of role in, in these scenarios? And I guess that can shift, but I'm just curious, you know, you know, where you come into play and in what situation. <clears throat> yeah, so Patrick's stuff was mostly kind of like the MCA thing. The reality of it is, is when these occur and they're in an emergency situation, we're not going to have a commission meeting and all yeah, everyone sure. vote and whatnot. So this actually, this happens really quickly. Um, the state partners, you know, the emergency management, obviously they, they have kind of the authority to set those pre-planning and all those, but the, the, the reality comes down to what occurs on the street. And typically that's in conjunction with either another law enforcement agency that's there um <clears throat> if it happens to be in say the city of bozeman uh but for in this instance we're talking about mostly the big sky area and it would also fall on the yeah so the sheriff's office as well as the fire department and so between myself and chief Meguard, there would be significant uh, communication as to what it is that we're going to be doing uh, in that particular scenario um the instance of park county was exactly that i mean obviously there's ton of sheriffs started sending bodies that way. 
we had, I don't know how many deputies from across the state that ended up over in Park County. Mm -hmm. There's, um, as well as um, even some local officers from uh, here as well. So as those things build out, there is plan for that. We have a statewide mutual aid program that is established mm -hmm. through um, Montana Sheriff's and Peace Officers Association. It's actually a Gallatin County employee that, that manages that. Uh, and so a call goes out and we had, you know, they got the National Guard helicopters there for us. They had all the other sheriffs showing up with people. So there's a fairly significant, fairly robust plan in place to get bodies there. But to Patrick's point, um, you got everyone here lives in a rural community and it is, doesn't matter if you're in Billings or if you're in Big Sky or if you're in Ekalaka. It's ultimately, there is going to be a time there where you are gonna have to be self-sufficient. And you're seeing that in Florida. They obviously have the resources available to them that we don't have, but you, there's plenty of people there that had to be self-sufficient for a number of days. And so it's pretty standard and it's gonna be the same way here. Sure. All right, well, so how is the public notified um, about maybe an evacuation or what they should do in an emergency specifically? Sure. I think people have it in their, they have a picture in their head of what an evacuation means. And it looks like an interstate full of traffic for 25 miles, right? That's pretty rare. Um, that is not typically what evacuations look like. And they, at least in this area, mm -hmm. um, the chances of evacuating an entire area of Big Sky is pretty slim. Typically it would look like a, like a subdivision, a location. Mm -hmm. um, it's not going to be what we, like, an example is the Bridger Foothills fire down here. Yeah, um, We're not evacuating the entire Gallatin County into some other area, right? So we're, we're very focused on a very narrow area of Gallatin County. So <clears throat> how does that look? The notification, there is obviously all the social media sites. There are a lot of, um, and Patrick could probably help me on the names of some of these, but the there are where we can open every cell phone in a particular area to say, then it opens up. It doesn't have, that's not one of those that you have to actually sign up for. But if once we draw the circle, the geo map, it can open up every cell phone in that geo map. And there's a message that says you are in, we get to create the message, right? So we, we send the message that says whatever it is that we want them to do. This is the Gallatin County Sheriff's Office. There's been X, Y, and Z. We ask that you drive southbound towards 191 or whatever, right? On 191, whatever the case may be. We can give directions that way. There's plans in place to get some reader boards up that way. So mm -hmm. there's lots of different ways to get that information out. There's no one particular way because if there's one particular way, that means there's a capability of a system failure. Mm -hmm. And so there has to be multiple different ways. So some of that is also door to door. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done that plenty too, where we have to go door to door to particular locations that takes, you know, about five minutes per door. So if we're going door to door and we've got, you know, um, whatever number of deputies depends on how many houses we're knocking on, but they, fi we figure about five to eight minutes per, per house. Mm -hmm. And also depends on how many questions they ask us. So anyway, but five to eight minutes is what we're looking at. So, um, We've done that plenty across the state as well and here locally as well. So the deputies are pretty versed in doing the actual evacuation portion of that. Um, the decision to do an evacuation is typically made at the street level in conjunction with commissioner's approval. We will talk to them on the phone. Uh, as Patrick said, the chairman would hear that and make a decision. They would then, they then go and do their community or their uh, political part of that. But at the street level, we're gonna continue if it's an emergency evacuation situation. Um, obviously we can't force people out of their homes. That's not what we do, um, mm -hmm. but we can notify them that this might be the last time you hear from us. And sure. um, we'll come back. You heard it, you saw that in Florida, that happens all across the country as well. So I was just gonna bring that up in terms of, you know, Hurricane Ian and, you know, other hurricanes specifically, you hear of people who, you know, there's a mandatory evacuation and they don't evacuate. I mean, I guess mandatory just means it's, you know, it's now up to you, right? The mandatory thing is, um, yeah, I can't drag someone from their house, right? Yeah. Oh, right. <clears throat> and so, and that I would never want to. The, mm -hmm. um, the mandatory notification though is essentially that at this point forward, you're not going to get any more emergency assistance um, until it's safe to do so. It's a notification that we recognize a threat's coming and things are going to change and we're not going to put 
people in that kind of harm's way after this point. So that's, uh, but that's kind of what those are. And yeah, they, they call them mandatory, but yeah, that's what they are. The uh, recognize, you know, that there are only so many responders, you know, the, the state does not really have like a, a response ready organization. Um, you know, the sheriff's office has that. The local fire departments have that. Um, the emergency management is a response organization in, you know, in management. They'll help us, and they're 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 awesome about getting like those state resources that are out there. If it's a wildland fire, yes, there are resources, but those are hours away, right? So things happen uh, quicker than that. Um, so the there are even the federal government doesn't really have like emergency response groups. Right. FEMA is a three to seven day event to get there you know that's not what i would classify as emergency response um so recognize that that there are limitations to what's available to people um as far as evacuations go big sky is a fairly simple one i mean there's certain two routes out and um by the same token there's lots of other things that we can do with evacuations um we do all across the country they're doing a lot more of these um, shelter in place type evacs and mm. there's a lot of shelter in place hit locations in big sky that make a ton of sense we've marked those out on maps those have been handed out to the big sky area uh, patrick's office has done a great job with that the um <clears throat> and so is joe's and uh so those are kind of i mean it all is very dependent upon the event itself yeah um, sure. you know we you guys can you guys see every day what a large evacuation looks like um, in the big sky area from about what is it, four <laughs> o'clock to six o'clock up there? Yeah, that's what it looks like. I mean, you back all the way up to Lone Peak, right? Or to Lone Mountain Ranch. Um, so that's what it looks like to try and get people out of location. Now, obviously, if it's an emergency situation, we can possibly close some lanes on 191 and make it a two lane highway down. Mm -hmm. um, that would take some deputies to close off some you know, some intersecting routes and whatnot. So there's things that we can do to make it quicker, but that's what it looks like. Got it. Well, thank you, Sheriff Springer, for that. Um, like to hop over to you, Chief Meegard. Um, you know, have you talk a little about Big Sky Fire Department's role in emergency planning and how has the department been training and preparing for a potential large scale emergency, like, you know, a wildfire in Big Sky, for example? Sure. Um, thanks, Joe. So we train every day for, you know, large scale incidents. Um, going back to what Sheriff Springer and, and Patrick said, you know, it's, it's a collaboration of, of entities getting together. We have a plan. We sit down, do a tabletop exercise, pull in players that we typically wouldn't have at the table. When you look at Yellowstone Club, Fire Department, the security built, um, Spanish Peaks, Moonlight Security, pulling them into a tabletop because they're going to be assistant law enforcement or fire, whatever it is. Um, going back to when you look at an incident, we talk whether it's an MCI plan, wildland, avalanche, you can name it. You know, we practice these drills. I believe Patrick has one coming up this week that practices a large scale incident. It's going to have in multiple agencies to come in and participate. The key is, is building relationships and collaborating, you know, because we don't want to have to develop a relationship when an incident happens while it's happening. We do that beforehand. Everybody on, on this panel today, we all know each other personally. We work together every day. We collaborate. You know, if we have an incident in Big Sky or anywhere in, in Galton or Madison County, there's a unified command system. So, you know, the sheriff's office is not working in a silo. Big Sky Fire is not the Forest Service. We're all sitting down, working together, come up with a plan what's best for everybody. And so, like I said, we, you know, we don't do big scale incidents every day, but we talk about response every day and how we're going to handle that. Um, Chair Springer and law enforcement, as he said, you know, they're going to be working on evacuation. We're going to be doing the initial attack, dealing with that, trying to help out wherever we can, along with the Forest Service and anybody else that's coming. Mm -hmm. And so you think about evacuation, getting people out. Think about us trying to get those resources in. We have a county mutual aid agreement that we can bring resources in. There's a statewide mutual aid agreement, as Sheriff Springer spoke to. So we're not only trying to get some people out of here, but we're trying to get a lot of resources in here, too. So that's a fine balance to really manage that. Got it. Well, I think, you know, I believe it was Sheriff Spring who said a little earlier, you know, there are 
certainly there could be an incident that would require the evacuation of all of Big Sky, for example, but most of the time, likely not. Um, tell me a little about, you know, the Jack Creek Road egress and, uh, and when there might be a scenario when that might be employed. You know, I'm going to defer to Patrick and the sheriff on that, because like I said, okay. they will be managing that, Joe. Um, mm -hmm. we, we certainly be in that unified discussion about when that is, but but that's not one person making that decision. That would be, you know, a team doing that. But I'll defer to Patrick or, or Sheriff Springer for that, because really that's going to fall into their arena when that determination is made. Yeah, Patrick or Sheriff Springer want to field that one? I'll take a crack at it. <laughs> I, I think the answer is that it, it comes down to what the situation is. And, sure, sure. you know, if the smarter route is to go out through Moonlight because of some sort of road obstruction due to whatever, you know, on 191, um, you know, that's an option. Or, or the other option could be, you know, there's a significant flow out and maybe you're splitting the traffic to go both directions. Um, you know, Greg mentioned it, you know, there's a challenge of getting people out of, if that's a smart route to go to do large group mount move large amounts of people out of the community but we also need to be able to get um, response personnel into the community at the same point in time and where that's following one responder one direction and and residents out the other direction or keeping both lanes open on 181 you know that that'll depend on what's going on at that point in time sure. one of the big things you see especially in large wildfires you know around the west in recent years a lot of the injuries and in, and fatalities have come from people trying to drive out of the community rather than staying put when the fire front's coming through. And, you know, that's the, an important thing to keep in mind is if you're told to leave, there's a reason the officials are telling you to leave. If you're told to stay where you're at, there's a reason they're telling you to stay where you're at. And a lot of the times, you know, people are told to leave and like, I don't know how bad can it be? And they stick around and then they try and leave when it's no longer safe to leave. And that's when problems occur with people getting injured trying to leave, and it obstructs the responders from getting in and dealing with whatever the situation is. So, you know, kind of like being self sufficient, we also ask you to trust us when, you know, the sheriff says, take this action. There's a reason he's telling you to do that, and, mm -hmm. and you should really consider doing that. So, sure. I guess I'll stop at that point. And if Dan wants to add to that, anything to add there, Dan? <clears throat> I think you're exactly right, Patrick. And well, I guess the only thing I would add is um, that's also why we can't say if, you know, here's the exact plan that yeah. we're going to do mm -hmm. for this evacuation. And I, you know, Big Sky has been kind of really wanting that. And, and it just, it really, really depends on what the event is. And so mm -hmm. Patrick's point is exactly right, that if, there might come a time where we say, you know, we need to get you down the road, or it might be a time where we say, we need y'all to park right here. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Wildland fires are a great example of that. They, you know, they moonscape the, the fuels, but they won't typically moonscape, you know, grass, green grassy areas. And so it, it might not be fun. It might not be very comfortable, but, you know, some of us had, there's tons of videos of like when guys had to ride out fires in like Yellowstone and Old Faithful. And one of my deputies was there actually during that. And so, you know, there are safe spots and it's kind of an uncomfortable position to be in, but you're safe and the fire can blow over and then we'll, we'll work from there. So sure. there's lots of different scenarios out there. The golf course is pretty close to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great place. Hole seven or something like that. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, thank, thank you guys both for that. Um, you know, chief Megard brought up uh, the interlocal agreement. Uh, Joe Brummel, I'd like to, you know, move over to you here, you know, so yes, Gallatin and Madison counties recently signed an interlocal agreement to consolidate emergency services. Um, can you talk a little about uh, that agreement? Well, sure. It's a, it's, you know, it's a portion of where it actually solidifies the agreements be both be, between both counties on the top down level. Hmm. That's where the commissioners all came to the table and identified the need for it and solidifying the plan. Uh, it kind of mirrors the plan that's already in place by the either dispatch or the sheriff coverage in the area, but also designates kind of a funding source to put that uh, an emergency management plan or what it takes everyone's responding agency's plans, consolidates those and best suits the agency or the community that it serves. Mm -hmm. So why not have Gallatin County, which they already have the agencies there, they already have the responders there. It just makes complete other sense to have the plans that they already have in place 
the mitigations and the risks already identified in place. It just solidifies those agreements. It puts a funding source to assist with those agreements. Uh, we're not going to be hands off. We're not wiping our hands away from it. Sure. You know, if any time they need help, it's it goes back to re, uh, relationships that have been built for years and years between both counties. We all work great together. We get along together. And it just it's just a portion that makes just clean, good, common sense to have Gallatin County, since the major port of Big Sky is in that area. Responding agencies are there. Let's have them uh, take the lead on it. And we'll be there to help out any way and every way we can. Excellent. Yeah. That, nice work on, on getting to that place. You know, it makes, makes total sense. Um, uh, Caleb Schreiber, uh, thanks for joining us and thanks for your patience uh, getting to you. But, you know, I was curious, how does the U.S. Forest Service work with local agents, agencies in the event of a wildfire, per se? So what does that, what does that look like? Uh, it looks like, you know, a number of different things, but um, largely we they referred to unified command earlier. So if we have a, a wildland urban interface type of fire where, you know, there's potential for structures to be involved or a community is at risk, we're definitely gonna be engaging in um, some sort of unified command if again, we have protection responsibilities in that area. So mm -hmm. locally here on the Custer Gallatin National Forest, um, the Bozeman and Hebgen districts, um, our protection areas look mostly like covering national forest system lands, but also uh, the, the Big Sky community itself has a lot of uh, protection that we are responsible for as a national forest. Um, and that's through some offset agreements and other types of agreements held at the state and other levels uh, where, where some other agencies protect some national forest system lands and things like that. Um, so we work really closely with Big Sky Fire and Gallatin County and Madison County and all of our other pa partners, both uh, in the pre-planning uh, events and then when an actual fire occurs. Um, even small, so we've had a number of small fires, for example, in the Big Sky area this year. And, um, you know, we work with Big Sky Fire. Oftentimes our, our resources are further away from the Big Sky area. We have two engines in West Yellowstone and two engines in Bozeman. And so Big Sky Fire Department is obviously much closer to that area. So they'll respond on National Forest System lands. Um, and as well as we'll come up to Big Sky and respond on private lands within Big Sky that fall under our protection. Uh, but oftentimes, yeah, the Big Sky Fire Department is the first one on scene in those areas and will come in if needed or needed to assist and, and vice versa. So we have a good um, interagency agreement in place and good working relationships uh, across those boundaries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Well, you mentioned one thing, the wildland urban interface that I think warrants a bit more discussion. Um, you know, with an increasing populace with people building more homes in, you know, the wildland urban interface, have you or you specifically or the Forest Service noticed a change in the way you're fighting wildfires or, you know, is, is there been an increase in structure protection as opposed to um, you know, getting after the fire itself? So um, I would say that that's more driven by maybe climate change and fuel buildup and some of those types of things, lessons learned from tragedy fires that we've had and, and that type of stuff. Then it is directly related to the urban interface, though that definitely plays a factor in there. Um, over, we still have an aggressive initial attack and an extremely successful initial attack rate as far as, you know, 99% of fires are caught small. It's really the 1% that cause 99% of the damage and that you, you hear about. So we still definitely have an aggressive initial attack. Um, we do try to manage uh, landscape as well. So where it is feasible to do so, we may look at opportunities to manage a natural ignition to meet uh, resource objectives as outlined in our forest management plans. Um, but it, in the Custer Gallatin and on the, the zone that I'm responsible for, those opportunities are hard to find. 
we have successfully done that in the past, but um, we don't have large contiguous blocks of land and we have a lot of values kind of surrounding some of those areas, um, say as compared to like the Bob Marshall wilderness or mm. some of those other places where that's more frequently done. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, we, we've been talking a little about this. The collaboration is something that's kind of coming to the surface for me here. You know, Madison and Gallatin counties, um, you know, they've also recently entered into, you know, an agreement for emergency management funding. Uh, I guess I'd point this to, to Patrick or Joe or both of you, whomever would like to field it. But if you could explain a little about what that money is and, and what it would be used for specifically. Sure, I can start off and Joe can start chime in. Um, so basically, when the commissions were talking about, you know, how do we consolidate the services in the area, we also want to make sure that, you know, the equity contributed by the residents on both sides of the county lines was equalized and, and also add capacity to better serve the overall county, you know, as we're looking to grow. Um, so we we're piecing several different functions together. So basically, you know, when that money comes from Madison County to Gallatin County annually, um, each year as a budgeting process, we'll, we'll carve up where that goes to based on what activities we see coming that year. Um, largely speaking, it's going to operational costs to support our organization as we grow, add employees, um, to support the different activities that we're doing across the entire county to obviously include Big Sky. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, for example, fiscal year 23, the year that we just started, um, the funding, some of this funding is going to support salary of a new preparedness and mitigation manager position that we brought on in July. Um, a little chunk of that money will go to help pay for the new vehicle for that employee, as well as the, a little chunk of that money will probably go to help repair the uh, variable message sign the emergency management has in Big Sky that Resort Tax paid for. Got a bunch of a bunch of little bulbs that are out that will be fun to repair. Lots of soldering I hear. So um, it'll support projects like that. You know, in the future, I, I, it'll support ongoing costs like fuel, services, stuff like that, but also like to support other specialized projects as they come up. You know, so like this year we were able to give a uh, firefighting slip tank to Big Sky Fire Department, um, but there you have on their UTV um, for down there in the community. You know, now we're dragging the county's hazmat team to cover a little bigger chunk. So I could see support, using some of that money to help support hazmat team needs as they arise. Um, as well as, you know, we've had the community notification system that's covered that entire area, but it's been wholly funded by Gallatin County for many, many years. Um, so as new things come up or we need to make changes to that, I can see little pieces of that money used to help pay for some of those um, adjustments for that system. Mm. Got it. Joe Bromo, anything to add there? Sure. It's a, well, just like the agreement that we put in place mm -hmm. and with any planning, it's, it's a live and breathing document. It's really nice that um, both counties are progressive enough in their thinking that if uh, something doesn't work in a year or two, we'll sit down, we'll talk about it and uh, we'll tweak things to make things work right. That's just not only with the interlocal agreements, but that with all emergency planning, if something's not working right, uh, be kind of cognizant enough to where we can switch it and make it work for both communities. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you both for that. Um, Chief Meegard, I bounce over to you here. Uh, and this may be anybody, anybody could actually talk to speak to this, but it just makes me think of sort of mitigation techniques and uh, fuels reduction. And, you know, Chief Meegard, if maybe you could talk a little about one, the, the sort of fuels reduction programs that the Big Sky Fire Department is undertaking. And two, do you recommend that people reduce fuels on their own private property? Yeah, the answer to the last question is absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we um, will go out and evaluate personal properties um, to see what their defendable space is. We have a chipper program through a grant that we received. Uh, Chief Tatro gets, sorry about that, um, every year. And we went out and, and worked in subdivisions with subdivision uh, HOAs to really do some thinning, cleaning. Uh, we're partners with Moonlight Basin right now, a big project up along Jack Creek Road for thinning, taking down crown fuels, um, widening the space to protect Jack Creek Road. Uh, Moonlight has been a big partner in that. 
So mm-hmm. yeah, we we have a program, Joe, that we're willing to go out and evaluate anybody's personal property. We have a lot of uh, information that if they want to go to our website can get. Um, we encourage anybody and everybody to look at their property. Is it defendable space? What kind of fuel do you have close to your house? Can you get rid of them? Those types of things. So there's a lot of things that private property owners can do to protect their own property. Um, you know, materials that they choose to build with is a huge deal. Um, so you're seeing a lot of movement all across the Western states about, you know, building materials, non-combustible building materials, those types of things. And when you really compare the costs, there's not that big of a difference, um, depending on the, on the types of materials you use. So when you really look at it, there's a lot of programs out there. There's so much information about what you can do to safely protect your house. Is never a guarantee, but anything you do is going to be better if you have a lot of fuels. I mean, you talk to somebody, uh, Sheriff Springer spoke about the Bridger fire. You talk to some of the homeowners there, thought they were miles away from the fire and how quickly that distance closed and the, the types of materials their houses were built out of. They thought they were safe. They came back and the house was completely gone. So there's a lot of things property owners can do on their own to really make sure that they're managing their properties themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's really good to hear. Um, you know, you're, we're nearing a point where we, we'd like to move into some um, audience Q and A. But before we get there, I guess I, I and maybe this is for Sheriff Springer and and or uh, Patrick Lonergan. Um, you know what I've heard you guys talking about, and it seems a, a, a important point to reiterate is that you know emergencies, disasters, I mean, these things, there's no one size fits all plan. And that's what I've heard you guys talking about. Uh, you know, it's situational and it will depend. Um, I guess Sheriff Springer, I'd start with you. Any any advice that you'd like to give people in terms of whether it's how to stay calm or how to prepare or how to, you know, stockpile supplies, anything like that, you know, kind of parting words from you. You know, I think probably one thing that we should send out, and I'll get this up to, um, I'll bring it up to me tomorrow, um, is there is a whole packet of information that we would normally hand to someone when we're doing an evacuation from the residence. It mm-hmm. lists the items that, you know, you would want to, you know, take with you. There's what to plan. You know, we have a, a, a notification like here, you should be getting prepared for this. When we come back will be the time for you to probably leave. Um, so that gives people a better understanding of what it is that we need them to do in preparation for that. Um, mm-hmm. And rather than try to go over it here over the, you know, without reading it, but there is a, there's a list of that. And we have all of that stuff in hand. We, we give those to people. Uh, that would be something that we could probably get out, that we should get out a little ahead of time for people to at least see somewhere. Um, mm-hmm. and I believe it's on the websites, but, um, you know, if people are interested, Patrick would be able to answer that a little better than I can. But we can, if it's not, we can get that stuff on there. So make sure that they can see it ahead of time if they want. But I'll bring some of that with me. That'd be great. Yeah, Patrick, anything to add there? No, I think the key is, you know, like many things in life, you should try and be as self-sufficient as possible, as resilient as possible. You know what you need and what your family needs to be self-sufficient. And, and try and, and think in those terms and not just in time shopping, you know, wait until the last day your medication runs out to get it refilled, <laughs> things like that. You know, there are numerous different places that you can get information on the internet and all over the place about, you know, recommended items that you should take with you, that you should have extra of. And they're all very similar um, concepts. And, and so I would encourage anybody to, you know, if you're not sure, spend a little time on the internet, you can go to, our county websites, you can go to Google, all sorts of things and find a variety of information that gives you that general information. And I just, I think the key here is the more prepared the majority of our community is, the easier it will go for everybody and the more load that will take off the system. So, you know, if 50% of your community is relatively self-sufficient and they don't have to get out of there that day, or the next day for whatever the winter storm or the volcano or whatever it might be, the earthquake, you know, the easier it will be to deal with those that truly do have an emergency and need immediate help. So look at it as not only, you know, making your family resilient and as well prepared as possible, you're also helping your neighbors and the rest of your community. Yeah. 
That's great. Great advice. Much appreciated. Um, yeah, well, thank thank you guys. Thank thank you very much. I guess uh, Jenny, um, love to go to you and see if we have any questions uh, from the audience. Perfect. Also, we've got a few rolling in. Um, the first question is: Is there a map that shows all the alternative evacuation routes from Big Sky, as well as all of the potential safety zones within our community? Hmm. I'm not sure who might be best to field that. I mean, maybe that's maybe that's you, Patrick, or Sheriff Springer. Go ahead, Patrick. Do you want to you want me to answer that or do you want to take it? It doesn't matter. We can take Tim. Go ahead and start, Dan. So there are some maps out there that show the main evacuation routes. There are some less known ways to get through some of the subdivisions. Some of those are not necessarily a great egress road in the sense that if one vehicle stops then you've got line of cars that can't get out mm -hmm. and there's no way to turn around so some of those are not areas that we would want to use um, in that setting or in that sense there are safety zones um, can be there's so many different safety zones depending upon what we're talking about like you, you can have a safety zone in your front yard um, on a wildland fire it doesn't take um, an entire golf course to make that happen right so there's there's multiple, multiple safety zones. Now, are there gathering spaces like the, the parking lot at the top of the mountain? Absolutely, those, those are well marked. The, um, at the base, at the, in the meadow between the golf course and the, um, the hospital and the, the village, those are all areas that are, would be a safer location. So those are all marked on that map, but as far as how, I mean, there would be, there are a lot of safety zones in a, um, in a wildland setting, say. And Greg, you probably would be able to answer some of that too, because I'm sure you guys have mapped out escape routes and safety zones and all those kind of things in your wildland areas as well. Yeah, we have, and, and a lot of them are very consistent with the map that Sheriff Spring is talking about. One of the newer buildings that we have in the town center is the base complex. It's, it's completely non-combustible, has a lot of square footage. I think we could look at ADMAT as a facility to bring people to, to coordinate, do things like that. But, you know, like, like Sheriff Springer said, you know, the ski resort parking lots, golf courses, um, just green open space are, are good, you know, protected place or evacuation zones. I think you guys, real quick, just, is there, is that map, is that map available? Is that something that, that people can access? Maybe Sheriff Springer, is that something you know about? Um, yeah, and I would say, I think Danny would know, um, and Greg, Kevin Germain, um, I think who asked the question, that was given out to the um, Big Sky Resort Tax Board at our last county mm -hmm. meeting. Um, so they might know where that ended up with, you know, up in that area. Hmm. Yeah, D Dan, are you with us? You, is there is there a way to access that on the um, BizRad's website or something along those lines? Patrick, I think um, Whitney and you were working towards kind of kicking that out. Did it wind up on a website or where? I don't know the answer to that, to tell you the truth. So I'm not sure where all it's been posted or not posted. All right, I'll make this promise. I'll get it posted. I'll talk to Whitney. It should be it should be out there somewhere. So I'll send it up to you guys today. It's great. Perfect. Thank you. Joe, if I could add real quick, I think sure. the key here, like a lot of things you said, is it's really hard to say for sure where yeah. it's best to go. And, and I think the advice would be know your community. It's a little harder for the visitors, but you know, those that are living and working there know the proper names of the actual main roads know the proper names of some of the key facilities around the community. So when you're told, hey, we want you to go to the day skier parking lot or wherever we're saying you, we want you to go, we want you to go on Montana Highway 64. Well, do they know that by that term or by the spur road? So the better understanding of the community will help us um, provide clear directions. And I would also encourage people to register in our community notification system. You know, there's numerous different paths that will push information, but those that are registered in the system have a much higher likelihood of getting quicker 
and more accurate and focused information on what they are specifically supposed to do based on where they're located. Can we, can we just let people know how to register with that system? Yep. The easiest thing to do is go to readygallatin.com. And on that main page on the very top, it says community notifications. In the center of the screen, it says community notifications. You could also probably Google Gallatin County Community Notification System. And it will tell you what it is, how it works, the options, and how to get registered. Got it. Awesome. Great. Thank you. We're good, Jenny. You got any other any other audience questions? I'll pull another one on, and I'll just um, kindly ask anyone that is typing into the Q and A to make sure that it's clear who you'd like to answer your questions. Some of these are a little hard to know who it's directed at. Mm -hmm. um, we understand that Big Sky is unique, and the one thing I'm not hearing is how that we will communicate with visitors in an emergency. Hmm. So I can speak to that a little bit if you'd like. So again, there's no one size fits all. I'm sure Springer referenced it earlier. So there's a variety of ways that people can get notified in our mass notification system that we call our community notification system pushes through a lot of different commercial and governmental paths. So when we push a notification, we can push to people that have registered. We can push to any place that has a landline phone, and when I say landline, even an internet-based phone, um, as well as we can use what's called wireless emergency alerts. So those are like the Amber Alerts that you've seen, um, likely, um, that does not require a subscription. Um, we can also activate the emergency alert system, um, which would trigger you know, radio stations, television stations, that sort of thing, if they have those devices on as well as it pushes to a variety of different um, commercial platforms that pull that data from FEMA. So the most prevalent example of that is Google Maps. If you have the Google Maps app loaded on your phone and you have the emergency alerts enabled on that and you are located inside the box that we draw or you drive into that box at some point, Google Maps will go off with the notification too. So there's a variety of ways that people can get um, information that some of them require them to take action and enroll, and some of them are automatic. Um, they do not require any sort of action on their part to receive. I will point out, nothing's perfect. There's very, it takes multiple different paths to reach multiple different audiences, and, and we almost always use a very broad approach based on the audience and, and what tools we deploy. Hmm. Interesting, thank you. I think Jenny, we probably have, have time for another one if you've got, got one queued up. Okay, perfect. This one is more just response to the question about the map. It is posted on the Gallatin County Emergency Services website. Mm. Um, and then I'll dive into one more question. Um, Who evaluates the adequacy of emergency evacuations plan? Is there a rating process and how does Big Sky's emergency plan rate if there is such a plan as we are in a one way in and one way out type of location? Hmm. Sheriff Springer, you wanna to, want to tackle that one or is this more Patrick, Chief Meegard? I'm not aware of any particular one that does a rating that I'm aware of. Um, I can tell you that the evacuation process and plans that are put in place by both emergency management and by the sheriff's offices across the state have been very effective. Um, and we've shown that we are, that the evacuations have been very more than adequate. Um, to my knowledge, we have not lost a single life or in an evacuation process. And we've been doing it for multiple, multiple years now. So. Hmm. Got it. Anyone have anything, any final uh, words of wisdom, anything else to add? Can I say something real quick? Yeah. <laughs> so I know this is off key, but it's that time of year. Please clean your chimneys and have them inspected. Mm -hmm. Definitely. One thing else I'd like to add, Joe, and I should have mentioned earlier is for the last couple of years, two to three years, Big Sky Fires really looked at enhancing our response capabilities for wildland in mm -hmm. partnership 
excuse me, in partnership with uh, resort tax on some of our capital purchases, we've added two type five engines and we'll take delivery this weekend of a type three engine specifically for wildland. So when you look at the ability to have access to that apparatus, um, that's significant. So now we now have a type six, two type fives, and, a, and we'll have a type three in service here shortly, which gives us our ability to really address some of the wildland uh, challenges that we've been facing. That's great. That's good to hear. Um, well, I really appreciate everyone's time. I just want to reiterate, you know, to our audience, uh, you know, it's pointed out by, um, you know, everyone here, but readygallatin.com is where you can register um, you know, for the community uh, notification system. So readygallatin.com, go there, register. It'll help, um, you know, these guys and, uh, you know, all of our first responders best um, deliver messaging uh, to the people who need to hear it. Um, what a fascinating discussion. Very helpful, guys. Uh, Thanks to all of you for tuning in and, and a big thanks to our panelists. Um, I'm Joe O'Connor, managing editor with uh, nonprofit media organization, Mountain Journal. And this conversation on local emergency management has been part of the Big Sky Community Week hosted by the Big Sky Resort Area District and the Big Sky Chamber of Commerce. Uh, check this week's event schedule, the remaining part of the week and uh, watch the full recording of this conversation, uh, which will be available tomorrow morning. Um, you can check the schedule and watch this full recording at BigSkyCommunityWeek.com. Uh, thank you, everybody, again. Really appreciate it. Danny, Jenny, thanks so much for uh, facilitating and, and helping us make this happen. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, all. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Have a great afternoon. You too.